we are going to start the panel dedicated to uh, digital publications. And I would like to introduce our guest. So, our guest today uh, in, this, in this next panel is Gary Hall, uh, who is Professor of Media and Performing Arts and Executive Director of the Center for Post-Digital Cultures at Coventry University. A critical theorist and media philosopher working in the areas of digital culture, politics and technology, he is the author of a number of books, including Pirate Philosophy, The Uberfication of the University, Digitize This Book, The Politics of New Media or why we need open access now. Um, in 1999, he founded the open access journal Culture Machine, an early champion of open access in the humanities, and he will be talking about this in a minute. Um, in 2006, he co-founded Open Humanities Press, which, is, which he still co-directs. He, also, he also co-edited OHP's Liquid Book Series and the Joint Information Systems Committee funded Living Books About Life series. Please welcome Gary Hall. Is the presentation on? Okay. Uh, thanks. Thanks for inviting me so much. Really good to be here. Uh, the, the Polish person in my life tells me it's the, the day of the dog. So happy day of the dog in Poland. Whatever that means, I know what the celebration involves of that. You're just nice to the dogs in your life. Uh, you can tell me afterwards. Okay, so, uh, yeah, the idea of this panel that we were going to, um, you know, when you talk about doing these kind of things, you know, months in advance, you think, well, we'll improvise and we'll kind of keep it sponta spontaneous and all this kind of thing, and then life intervenes and it didn't quite work out like that. So I'm going to give a little bit of a presentation and then Christoph's going to give a little bit of a presentation and then we'll do the little bit of the talk, you know. It's uh, probably just as well, we're all after lunch, we've all had some nice food, we're all a bit kind of mellow, so this is probably the best way of doing it. I'm going to start... <coughs> yeah, I'm going to start... Uh, I'm going to pick up where... Felix left off, where Lena left off, where lots of the presentations have left off. We kind of get to this point where we're co-constitutive, uh, co-emergent, co-producing, co-creative. Uh, and one of the questions, I think, at the end of uh, Felix's session is, well, what kind of strategies can we do once we get to that point? What can we, what can we do once we get there? So I'm going to try and talk about that uh, a little bit. Um, and by going through some of the projects that we've been uh, working on over the last however many years it is, 20 years or something like that, and talking about some of the thinking behind them. Um, if I move to the next slide, what you'll see is that... Oh, no, oh no, it's got too hot again. No. All oh, right, no, we're right at the end. That's where we are. See, OK, there you go. So that's the projects we've been involved in uh, over the years. As you can see, there are uh, quite a lot of them. And one of the aims of these projects, if I kind of sum them up, is to kind of move from the left-hand side of the column that you saw previously to the right-hand side. So we're trying to move the way that we all work and think and are being in the world, as Felix was talking about. So if we can try and nudge things uh, from the left-hand side uh, to the right hand side. I've added some of the norms that I highlighted, if anyone, I'm sure you've all been, uh, been to the M2 Museum here in Woodge, uh, and I've added some of those at the bottom, so modernity, the museum, uh, autonomy, capitalism, they've kind of got a big exhibition there that kind of emphasising some of those. So maybe that's something we can think about or discuss later, how we might move from those kind of norms and concepts, what would be on the other side of the, of the columns then. Obviously, no one project alone can hope to articulate or enact all of these alternative norms. So instead, what we do is we like, quasi-transcendentally uh, move towards them or interrogate them by means of a, a repertoire of different projects, uh, working with a diverse range of collaborators, as you'll see, from uh, a lot of different locations around the world. 
Now, often when I talk about these projects uh, and the critically oriented uh, communities that I'm involved with, I focused on one or two uh, in detail. However, what I'm going to try and do in the little bit of time I've got is give you a little bit more of an overview, a kind of more of a, a mind map, uh, if you like. So I'm going to break them down into thematic sections, but probably only the first, uh, first two that I'm going to have time to really go through with you today. Uh, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to begin, and if I have time, end by making some kind of orient, orientating points for this kind of uh, mind map. So the first of these orienting points is that these kind of world-making projects, if you like, are about making many worlds. So it's a pluriverse, a pluriverse rather than the universalism of Western liberal uh, modernity. And you know, the latter for people like the Zapatistas is that's a world where only one world fits. So we want something more plural that's kind of working with the Latin American thinkers, Arturo Escobar and other people like that, boring on their concepts. The second thing to think about is with these projects that they're performative in that they're concerned not just with representing multiple worlds, they're also concerned with uh, interacting with them in order to do things within and as part of these worlds. So you might think of these projects as dispositifs or concrete social apparatuses. If you want to borrow the language of people like Foucault and Deleuze and Agamben, for whom a dispositif is anything that has in some way the capacity to capture or orient or determine or intercept or model, control or secure the gestures, behaviours, opinions or discourses of living being. So you can use Think of them in terms of dispositifs. If maybe a more contemporary term would be uh, to think of them in terms of prefiguration, there being the change that we want to, to see. You know, maybe an earlier version, an earlier way to think of them would be in terms of the event. Third is that, as the political theorist Chantal Mouffe emphasizes, the striated nature of the globalized space in which there's a multiplicity of sites where relations of power are articulated in specific local and regional and national configurations means that what's cried is required is a variety of strategies. So for my collaborators and I, uh, as you can see from the quote from Jacques Derrida, it's necessary in each situation to cr create an appropriate mode of expression. So to invent the law of the singular event, to take account of the presumed or desired addressee. And again, that's not too far away from more contemporary versions of theory would, yeah, we talk about it in terms of situatedness. Okay, so, first of these kind of categories would be experimental publishing. There's a few projects to go through. So back in, oh, uh, 1996, yeah. Uh, Dave Berthold and I were given about 500 pounds by the department that we worked in at the time to set up a journal. And at the time, that was enough money to just about publish one issue of a print journal. Or we found that if we went digital, we could set up a whole online journal for the same amount of money. So that's what we did, and we set up a culture machine. So launching in 1999, there were very few online open access journals in the humanities uh, at that time. I think there's only a couple that were before us. Uh, Postmodern Culture, which started in 1990, and uh, Surfaces in 1991. I think Postmodern Culture is the only one that's still going. Culture Machine is still going, uh, so it's over 20 years old now. However, in 2018, in an attempt to further extend the geopolitics of its critical community beyond that of the global north, we relaunched the journal out of uh, Mexico under the editorship of Gabriela Mendez Cotta out of the University of Iberoamericana in Mexico and Rifico Ruiz of the Canadian Centre for Architecture in Montreal. And it had a complete redesign at that point by the Mexican hackerspace El Rancho Electronico. If we go back to 1999, though, after launching Culture Machine, we soon discovered that just how difficult it is for new 
journals to achieve any status. And that's because a new journal can be high quality, being really good immediately, but that kind of prestige, that reputation takes time to develop. So in 2008, we addressed this issue by banding together with a number of other such journals to form Open Humanities Press, or OHP, as we say for short, which is an international scholar-led publishing collective. This was launched by myself and two colleagues who are currently based in Australia, Sigi Yupkent and David Ortina. And OHP involves multiple semi-autonomous self-organising groups, all of which operate in a non-rivalrous fashion. So its mission is to make works of contemporary critical thought, critical theory, available on a non-profit, open access basis. And at the moment, we currently have 21 journals in the kind of fields that many of us are interested in, so media theory, technology, literary studies, philosophy, feminism, post-colonialism. And the plan when we first started was to spend the first few years establishing a relationship, a reputation for OHP's journals. Um, we're going to do that first and then go to the more difficult problem of publishing books, open access. However, things kind of developed a little bit quicker than we anticipated. And as soon as we did launch, people got in touch saying, oh, great that you're doing it for journals. Can you do it for books as well? So in 2009, we established the OHP Monograph project. So the idea there was to move forward both open access publishing in the humanities and the open access publishing of monographs. Monographs are seen as more difficult, uh, the more expensive to produce, and the copyright uh, tends to be different because authors get paid for the books, then the copyright uh, agreements are different for journals where people don't get paid, uh, and so it's easier for, for them to be made open access. So today we've published more than 60 relatively conventional digital first books, distributed across, I think it's about nine book series at the moment. I thought we'd get some mention of mushrooms in there, so. How it's never been our aim to simply increase uh, our editorial projects, dispositifs, by publishing an ever larger number of books and journals. We prefer to uh, non-scale, as Anna Singh calls it, or small scale, as some of my colleagues have taken to calling it. And this involves those journals and book series and communities of authors and editors that are part of OHP opening themselves to what Singh describes as the kind of meaningful diversity that might actually change things. So the idea here is not for Open Humanities Press to accumulate ever more straightforward elements, such as conventional open access journals and books, and just get bigger and bigger and bigger until it kind of rivals Routledge or Cambridge University Press or whoever it was. What we're trying to do is add distorting elements that have the potential to push us to rethink the Open Humanities Project. And distorting elements would be, you know, something like the Liquid Books Project. So this is a series of digital books that are published on a gratis Libra basis, so they're free to, to access and read, but they're also free for people to interact with, to change, to rewrite, to edit, do what you like with them. The users are able to engage with the wiki technology uh, with which the books are created and published, and they're able to do that live, so they're continually composing and adding to and editing and remixing them, and they can use text and images and infographs, uh, infographics, podcasts, videos, and more. So accordingly, you've got these books, and they're, in the subsequent versions of them, they're produced over time in an extended, decentralised, multi-user-generated fashion. It's so not only by their initial authors or curators, but by an open multiplicity of the often anonymous collaborators that are distributed around the world. And some of those authors will, of course, be machines. Uh, so it's a bit different from the interactivity we heard a little bit about uh, just before lunch. Uh, it's not just people can kind of interact with them, people can actually be authors of them. They can 
And there's not that difference between the author and the audience. The, the audience becomes authors or they have the potential to. So mention of video takes us to another distorting element that pushes us to rethink what we do. And I'm referring with that to OHP's exploration of some of the forms critical theory and thought and thinking can take if it's produced with media other than the printed codex books. So your cameras, mobile phones, film, video, augmented reality, AI, the kind of thing that were this being displayed and talked about today. So one example of this would be Joanna Zielinska's and Ting Ting Chen's image-driven online journal come gallery site, which is photo mediations machine, which ran from 2013 to 2020. And that was set up as a sister project to Culture Machine. And photo mediations machines speculated on the possibility that we're moving from an era in which we communicate primarily by writing to a post-literary or post grammatological culture in which communicating by network flows of mediation that produce photographic images, that's increasingly having priority. So such it was concerned not just with cameras, but computers, satellites, sensors, drones, Google Street View, etc. And the question it's asking is, what does this mean for contemporary theory and thought? Can we have a highly specialised publication, a, a journal of theory that's primarily image-based, yet retains all the rigour that would be associated with ordinarily with the writing of philosophy? And then the approaches that were developed in the Liquid Book series and photo mediations machine were then combined by Joanna Zelinska and Camilla Cook and others in the interactive photographic platform Photo Mediations and Open Book. And this launched in 2015, and the idea was to redesign a coffee table photography book as a free, remixable online experience. So like OHP's Living Books, it uses free content, which it draws from various online repositories. And then together with four specially commissioned chapters on light and movement and hybridity and networks, it also has three open chapters that, if you like, transcend the boundaries of the book, that are able to develop and grow over time. So they're made up of an open reader, which itself, as you can see, subsequently developed into a print book. There's a connection to a Tumblr-based social space, if anyone remembers Tumblr, called The Book is Alive, and there's also an online exhibition space. So this is what, if you like, scaling small is for us. The idea is not to accumulate more and more straightforward journals and book series. It's to add distorting elements, like photo mediations, that have the potential to push us to rethink OHP as a project. And the inclusion of such non-standard series and spaces has led us to change OHP. Among other things, they've challenged many of our assumptions as to what a book is and what a book can be. So it's again like Christoph was talking about earlier, about learning from the kind of doing. Partly doing this has made us have a bit of a rethink about some things. OK, conclusion. Some of the final orienting points for the mind map that I've provided provided today. As we know, uh, new materialism is currently quite fashionable in certain circles. Uh, and the reason I began with the dispositifs rather than you know, the prefigurative is that Deleuze describes Foucault's philosophy as being concerned with the analysis, analysis of concrete dispositifs. I want to stress that the initi initiatives of my collaborators and I, I wouldn't like them to be positioned in terms of concrete material practices. I know that seems an odd thing to say, but in articulations like that, it's often forgotten that the practices that go to create and publish and disseminate critical thought, there are always concrete dispositives. While the theory that privileges the concrete and the material is often kind of quite weak and stuck in a bit of a rut, precisely because this materiality is left invisible 
it's unmarked, it's unexamined, black boxed. So I would say that a lot of the theorists that you can kind of mentioned on this slide, I don't think Timothy Morton's there, but we might say it about Timothy Morton. We'd say, I'd certainly say it if someone like Bruno Latour. So as media theorists and philosophers, reading and writing texts is incredibly important to my collaborators and I. But if we are to intervene in our own processes of subjectification and our own apparatuses, as Agamben Wren recommends in his writing on the dispositif, then we need to experiment with different behaviours and gestures as theorists. Different forms of the relation between living beings and our devices, pens, computers, phones, publishing tools, language. This is what we see ourselves as pushing towards with these projects, with these dispositifs, with these prefigurative pieces of work. So as the legal sociologist Boaventure Tura de Souza Santos puts it, then we don't need more theories of revolution. What we need is a revolution of theory. We need a theory that's going to actually start from the basis that kind of Felix left us and Lena left us earlier today. So in keeping with this line of thought, I want to make it clear that when I've said I today, I haven't been just referring to myself. The theory performances that I've represented should rather be understood as merging from my ongoing interactive relations with a multitude of actors, institutions and communities, some of them in this room. So it can best be thought of stimulating the development of a novel togetherness that comprises neither singularities nor pluralities. If anything, the singular and the plural are co-emerging. I know that's kind of hard to think about. It kind of complicates notions like the commons. But maybe the Italian activist Luther Blissett gets close to this with their concept of condividuum. So far from striving to develop an original true or right philosophy or securely located authorial identity, the role of the thinker or the theorist for my collaborative, collaborators and I is more about helping to shape and conduct dynamic processes and generative relations and intervening to try and make things happen like that. Although we can never control that, this is very much, much not slipping into the kind of cause and effect, it's very messy. But what we're interested in is experiment with different possibilities for being a critical theorist or a critical thinker, and even perhaps producing theory without a theorist. Which brings us neatly back to what I said earlier about pluriversality. As I say, one of our aims is to move from the left-hand side of this column to the right. And the idea is not for just us to do it in our way and impose it on everyone. The idea is for us to encourage other collaborative projects and critically oriented communities by showing what can be achieved, how things might look if different reimagined ways of being and doing and thinking that I've been talking about with all their different behaviours and gestures and different forms of the relationship between living beings and dispositives, if they were accepted and adopted and experimented with more widely. Thanks very much for listening, appreciate it. Thank you, Gary, for this presentation. And um, what I will have to say right now is something rather small scale in, 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 uh, in relationship to what Gary has just presented. But I think it may chime in and create a space where we can discuss various possibilities. Um, Poproszę o prezentację. So I called my presentation, my short presentation, um, what should a digital publication look or feel like? 
And um, first, I would like to introduce the team uh, because we've been working on this um, as a as a bunch of people actually for some time. I started this a couple of years ago with this idea that I found most digital publications insufficient and why I, I will go into this later on. But um, when we started the lab, um, I, um, I developed, I, I wrote it down, these ideas, why I thought that we should change something. And I went to the technical university um, where I was a partner for uh, two professors to conduct a course. And uh, during that course, we started developing tools for that idea. And out of that course and out of that first work emerged uh, Piotr Karczewski, who is here with us, um, um, who is a programmer and with whom we've been working uh, together closely ever since. Um, the other uh, very important person early on was Michał Dąbrowski, uh, who is a designer and with whom I talked a lot about how such a book should look and feel like. Uh, so what I will be showing you today in terms of design will be his. And then there is Titus Szabelski again, um, uh, this time as, um, um, uh, as producer and editor, um, uh, who works with me on this series of publications. So what I will show you um, in a second, uh, it's, it's, it's a lot of his work. And um, so thank you, Titus. Um, I would like to mention two more designers, especially Maja Starakiewicz. She's a designer from Krakow and she's also been working with us. Uh, she's working on transposing her book, um, The Model and the Metaphor, which is about visuality in the, in the human um, um, in the humanities. Oof. Um, so she's trying to find an adequate digital format for, for a book that she has already published in print. Uh, and with Philippe Toffil um, uh, of Studio Siphon, we are working on another tool to publish um, Warburg-like uh, image atlases. Uh, so that's also a work in progress. And so uh, this idea that I mentioned before is called publication as a website. And it came out of, um, of, uh, of, um, of an experience that over the last, I don't know, 15 years, I've been reading more and more digital um, content, yes? Uh, I mean, not web journals, but, but more and more digitized books than books in EPUB format. And I found the, the experience of reading digital publications inadequate. Not in the sense that I couldn't get the, the content, but in the sense that books are also objects which give us some pleasure to read, yes? And that is something that I have, that, that I have uh, had discussions uh, about with many people, many friends, who, who are like, Krzysztof, I can't read digital stuff. I always print them out. Uh, I don't like it. It's not pleasurable. I like to hold a book, you know? And, and of course, there's this, there's this fetishism of the printed page and of the, of the smell of the paint and et cetera, et cetera. But I think it has also a lot to do with the, with the user experience, what we call user experience in the digital sphere, yes? Um, most of these, of these tools or these formats, <clears throat> they, are, um, they are simulations or emulations of paper, yes? Uh, especially the PDF format, yes, where if you read digital books, especially books, very often you get them in PDF format. So you know that if you open a PDF on a smartphone, it doesn't fit the screen and then you have to scale it and, and pull it around and the letters become small and it doesn't work. And if you have an EPUB, then it's all, it's all nice, but there is no possibility to have any pictures or videos or interactive content in any sensible way inside these books. They're only good for literature, and that, that they are really great for. But if you want to, to take advantage of what, what the digital space offers us, yes, so audiovisual interactive content, 3D models, animations, films, what have you, yes, then it doesn't work that well. Plus, it is, it is an experience that cannot be designed um, as a rule 
EPUBs are, bas are basically a format that are design agnostic, yes? They look always the way you want them to look. So there's no work for designers there. And I really value the work of designers because this is, I mean, they make the world tangible for us in specific ways. So the way we see things through the work of designers is, is I think also, it, it also has a cognitive aspect or the aesthetic aspect that Felix mentioned in, the, in, his, in his opening talk is. So this is something that we started working with. And, and another thing, why is it called publication as a website? is that when I started researching um, um, tools for publishing digital books, <laughs> they were always closed platforms. So, you know, uh, there's a very good tool that, that was designed by Apple that allowed to make um, interactive uh, books and everybody could do it. It was, very, it was very well designed, but you could read those books only on an Apple computer, which doesn't make any sense. Uh, I mean, of course, if you want to, to cater only to a very small percentage of the, of, of the population. And I even bought a book because there is this publisher, uh, very famous in the photography sphere, Mac Books. Uh, he does uh, fantastic books. But in around 2010, when the iPad came out, the original iPad, he was, totally uh, he was totally taken by this idea and was like, okay, let's do digital photographic books. And, uh, and of course, the, the, um, he had to close this endeavor after a couple of years because of the technology was not uh, developed enough. And he had to uh, rewrite every book <laughs> for various platforms, for Android, for iOS, and for the web. So it didn't make any sense. And he didn't make any money out of this, so after a couple of years, his, this endeavor faltered. And I bought a book from this publishing house that was made in this Apple book uh, uh, program which is a fantastic photo book by Juan von Cuberta, whom I love, and I can't read it anymore because I don't own a Mac anymore. So these were the things I was striving at, that you know, we need an open, an open platform. And what is open? The web is open. It has web standards. There are ways to present things on the web that will be always accessible or are supposed to be always accessible, but we don't have the tools to do this. Because all of the most of the available publishing platforms, they always create a paywall and they always create, they have this, uh, this way of pushing out applications yes, that have to go through either uh, the iOS app or the, the Google Play apps or through the Windows um, application store. Yes? So that I found very um, insufficient. Yes? So for me, uh, when I looked at what is available, like building a website that would work as a book or like a book or give us the experience, uh, like a proper experience of reading, yes, uh, where we could focus on what is presented, etc., etc., that would be an optimal thing, especially with something like, um, um, with something like uh, progressive web apps, yes, that is something that that appeared in the in, in the last couple of years, so. A website can work like an application, yes? So you can open it on, you, you can pin it to your home screen on your, on your phone, or you can install it like an application on your, on your laptop computer, and it becomes an object that you can open that sits there in your, in your um, taskbar or whatever. So it's like, it's at hand. It's not somewhere hidden in the bookmarks. And this idea of a, of a progressive web app is also interesting in the sense that you, you can utilize the computer's disk. So you could theoretically download stuff on it and, be, and not be reliant on uh, uh, internet connection. Yes? For example, if you have a book open on your, iPhone, on your phone, whatever phone it is, and you, and you go to on a plane, so you have to go airplane mode, and then you can download the, the content and still read it on, on, on the airplane. Yes? Um, and of course, the problem with PWAs is that Apple actually cripples that technology because they don't want uh, websites to, inter to interact with too many layers of their hardware because they want everything to go through the App Store because they make a huge amount of money through that, yes? So there's, there's all these questions involved. And so for me, the first thing is I didn't want a platform. I wanted a tool set that is some kind of, um, that is a very Unix idea, yes? To build small tools, this is again what uh, Gary mentioned, small scale, yes? To build small tools that do one thing very well, that don't try to do everything, 
Yes, because this is very often what happens with platforms. If you want to do a publishing platform, then you go, oh, let's handle the editorial process. Oh, let's handle the communication with the authors. Oh, let's handle the, uh, the paywall. Oh, let's handle everything. Yes, and then it becomes this huge thing that, uh, that is very unwieldy and that is also then expensive and expensive to maintain and expensive to develop, etc., etc. Yes. So the idea from the beginning was to keep it small, to keep it handy and to, to keep it m m very flexible because platforms favor large players, large publishing houses, et cetera, et cetera. And the big publishers in the internet, are th those are the huge publishing, publishing houses, yes? So our basic assumptions I have already mentioned, most of them. One of the most important ones, and this is something where I always felt that the reading experience in the internet was uh, lacking, or like digital reading experience, is the lack of annotation support. And this is something where PDFs actually work because they have, you can annotate a PDF and have it as a kind of metadata uh, in the file. So when you, put, when you take the file to another computer or to another device and you open it, then the annotations are still there. And I don't know how you do it, but if I read, I always scribble on the margins, I underline stuff, and it's kind of impossible for me to think without doing that. So for me, it was always frustrating to read stuff in the internet. And so if, uh, I, had this, I had this feeling that if we want to do a digital publishing tool, we need a way to annotate. Uh, the content, and that was one of the most difficult things I thought, but it turned out that it's not. Um, and some of the things I mentioned here, they're like very specific. I mean, Google Scholar indexing is just handy if you if you do scholarly publications because then they they are well positioned by uh, when you want to search for some stuff. Yes. Um, so we started developing this framework in very close collaboration with the designer, Michał Dąbrowski, because it was also a question of how such a publication should look. What would be an ideal reading experience? What would, what would good typography mean? Yes. Um, what kind of spacing and what kind of margins and what kind of things that go all around this uh, make such an, such an experience pleasurable even on a laptop? Yes. So that was the that was the um, the task of uh, of Michal. At the same time, um, we decided on a very specific uh, technological stack, and that is um, um, that is also something I don't know if if it's uh, if I should talk about it too much here because it's going to be too technological. <laughs> but um, uh, um, what it means basically is that our publications in the end are basically a stack of files. There is no database, uh, there is no uh, building special servers. It's just a bunch of files that we throw somewhere and that are served to a server, which means that in, this is the archival question, that in 10 years time, uh, these books should still be readable because they are, they are basically HTML plus CSS plus JavaScript, yes? And so that was also one of the prerequisites for if you want to have publications, they have to be, at least in theory, lasting objects. And uh, to make this happen, we also started developing another a helper application, which is called PubLab, which is, which is something I'm not going to show today because this is more for the editors. And we are preparing to do like a workshop for editors after the summer, I mean, in the late summer where you can actually get into that for people who would be interested in publishing using this, these tools. So it's a helper app that, that for editors to, to basically um, push the, the content from, from a, a finished form to the publishing, to the moment of publishing. And so here, this is our first design. It's, a, it's an old book. Uh, it's a book I published uh, 10 years, 11 years ago now. And uh, I decided to do it in digital version because uh, it's been out of print for quite some time and when people keep asking about it, so I thought, okay, let's do a, a digital re-edition of it so it, it will be widely available. And uh, it's also an experimental publication because it was this idea to combine uh, archival theory uh, in terms of academic theory with archival practice in terms of people who work at ar archival institutions and archival practice in terms of artistic practice, yes? And, and in, in, this, in this book, all these three layers are intertwined. So there's also um, fragments that are purely visual. And um, if you would like to explore it by yourself, will I be able to go there with a, oh yeah, see? Uh, 
you can go to Archive as Project Gatsby JSIO, and you will be you will be able to. to see the publication this is the this is the title page and this is how the book how the book is put together so i'm not going to scroll and to bore you with scrolling live now through the whole book but if anybody of you feels like looking into it please do it's still not ready for prime time yet we cannot publish it like openly right now not yet, but in a, like in a month's time, probably we will be ready. And using the same tool, we are finishing another book, uh, which is uh, uh, an exhibition catalog for the Arsenal Gallery in Białystok, uh, which is called D School, and uh, it's an uh, it's a project by uh, curator Katarzyna Różniak. Um, um, who has done fantastic, engaged, and critical uh, exhibitions. So um, you see this is basically the same UX design uh, as, the, as the former book, and quite small changes in it produced a totally different experience of a book. So we would like to uh, try to um, do as many designs as possible on this, one, on this one template, and we're also experimenting with other templates. And the idea is, of course, that ultimately we want to make this open source that everybody can use it, yes? To make it openly available and to try to um, um, experiment further um, using this tool set. And it's basically quite, it's open, it's light, it's everybody, basically everybody could come up with something like that. So that is our, that is our idea and we are planning to, to publish a whole series of books this year about it. Also, books of people who are involved in the in the VN Lab. Uh, Miłosz Hermanowicz, a stereographer who is sitting here with us, his book is in the pipeline and it's supposed to be published this year. And uh, Joanna Popinska's book on, on VR also. So, and the book after this conference is also supposed to be published on this on this technology stack. So we will be able to have a whole series towards the end of the year. Thank you very much. Uh, of course, you can ask as many questions as you want. Else got <laughs> and I can't see because the, the light is bright. Okay. Fire uh, away. My first question is you mentioned that the publication's been available in 10 years' time and in wanting that and wanting that to be possible. And I kind of understand that I'm really, really awkward and uh, I ask kind of strange questions counterintuitive questions. So what I'm thinking is maybe it would be okay for publication. I know we had this this morning and talking about Flash and oh, nothing's not supported on Flash and, and how can we get that back and, and but maybe is it okay for publications, books to be not available in 10 years time? Should, if people can have the, the right to be forgotten, can books have the right to be forgotten? Absolutely. Okay, next question. Um, can I just develop it one, one um, I mean, um, I think it's, it's one thing to, f to be forgotten and one thing to, to, to be forgotten because the technology has become obsolete. And so, I mean, if I have the freedom to say, okay, I think this book has run its course and, you know, nobody needs it anymore and I can pull the plug. That's a totally different situation than I want this book to be available, but I can't because it's in Flash or because it's in a technology that's obsolete and nobody can read it anymore. And then it's a question of, uh, of uh, then it's a different kind of problem, I would say. Yeah. And uh, yeah, we don't need to get into it now, but I'd also I'm curious who makes the decision if a book gets to be forgotten, because you instantly went to, I will choose. Yeah, the readers choose anyway. I mean, even if I don't pull the plug, I mean, if nobody reads the book, then it's dead anyway, even if it's available in the shelves. Okay. And, you know, there are books that we keep going back to, um, even, even though they are like 100 years old or something, and we still, we still reread them. So there are books that are being read and reread, and there are books that, you know, have run their course, and, and that's okay. The problem is that with those books that have run their course, they can always be rediscovered at some later 
you know, moment by other readers. And that is something that has been happening in the humanities over and over again. Mm. So, you know, I think it would be terrible if many of those books that have been forgotten actually did disappear, like physically disappear, because then there would be no possibility of rereading them, yes? And that is something that I think that this is why this discussion about interactive documentary also circled around this question of, of uh, you know, archival questions or availability, because then there are these projects that used to be there and they are no longer there, and we can't even we can't even see how they how they felt like. Although it's really hard to imagine how I mean to reconstruct for somebody who was born ten, twenty or thirty years ago to reconstruct a project that was published like in 1990. Because uh, I mean, computer screens looked different, computers looked different, like everything was different at that time. So. It's also a problem of the of you know like being able to transport yourself in a totally different uh, experience of the apparatus that surrounds you know. Okay, and I've got no idea where I'm going with this, but I'm just thinking, uh, just in response to, to what you're saying, because I'm thinking, because we're used to having this this idea of the you know the Library of Alexandria, and we should have all the books and we'll like keep them forever, and everyone will have access to this knowledge. But it's a very it's a very universalist notion of knowledge and our access to knowledge and what a library is and I'm trying to think if we're trying to move out of that notion of you know I was talking about the pluriverse there isn't a universe because if if you have kind of things are universal it n generally tends to be western eurocentric and it gets imposed on the rest of the world so if we want to move away from that if we're seeing the problems with that in terms of all the things we've discussed so far in this event in terms of you know, what does the climate, what it does for other peoples around the world, do we then have to have a different decisions about, instead of having a Euro-Western knowledge that just swamps the rest of the globe, do we have to forget some of that, like almost like reparations, and we, we kind of get rid of some of that Euro-Western knowledge all out there, and so there's more space for other forms of knowledge, other people to publish, other people to be able to write and share their ideas? Yeah, I think that's a, that's a question we will be going back to all over, I mean, over and over again, because, I mean, this is also a question that was already raised by Susan Zontag in the 70s, you know, when she wrote on photography. She was like, oh, looking at this flood of images, maybe we should think of an ecology of images, that some images just disappear and it's okay. And uh, uh, let's just forget about it. Uh, and then, you know, there are these moments when, I don't know, the Victorian Albert Museum was throwing a, a, away a whole archive of images that, that were purely documentary, docu um, um, docu how do you call it? not documentary, but they were documentational, yes? Um, they were reproductions of images. And then there was this huge outcry and, you know, and some researchers said, well, uh, we shouldn't be throwing them away because they give us information, like historical information, and they are still usable or interesting or, you know, images that, that, that tell us a story. Um, so I don't, I, I'm, um, um, I, I don't have like a clear agenda here in the sense that I understand what you're saying, but maybe hoarding all these books is actually pluriversal because, you know, in the logic of capitalism, it's like, okay, everybody reads this guy, we keep him. Nobody reads this guy, we throw him away. But maybe this guy we don't read is interesting because nobody, you know, realized this potential or hasn't yet realized this potential. And when he's gone, he's gone. I mean, and the digital sphere, you know, uh, has this thing to go back both ways. On the one hand, it amplifies very quickly and very strongly things that, that are trending, yes, in a way. But it's very easy, I mean, um, we say that the internet has infinite memory in the sense that, you know, like, I don't know, naked pictures leak out there and they're, they're out there forever, yes? But on the other hand, uh, the internet is an incredibly forgetful space. Like, stuff just disappears there and never to, to reappear again. And uh, also very important on very interesting stuff. And that is something that I find worrying because, it, you know, it's... Um, there's, there's been a lot of uh, talk about that, you know, that because of this um, culture of instantaneity, of the, of the immediate availability of, availability of everything, we have started to live in a, in a kind of instant present with no uh, backward stretch of imagination or of historical consciousness. So 
I don't know how in this digital condition to stimulate or produce such uh, perspective. Yeah? And that's certainly how when we first started getting involved in open access, the idea was that things should be made available. People who start opening their career as academics, you know, when you're trying to publish your first book, you've got to take it to a, a press and you've got to tell them it'll sell, it, this will really sell, undergraduates will buy this in their droves, it'll be on the first year reading courses. And none of us to build careers can generally publish that kind of book. You've got to publish a book that's much more specialist, that you know, a few interested people will buy, but not that many. But people should still have the opportunity to get that interesting work out there, even if only two people are going to read it in 20 years' time. Maybe that's okay. So yeah. that's definitely why we went down the open access route. One thing I'm increasingly thinking about is a concept called uh, situated openness, which is so that openness is not everywhere and always yeah. a good thing. Uh, so, for example, there are people in different places around the world, uh, I was mentioning Latin America, who are kind of fed up of making their work available and then people in... in uh, better resourced institutions, part of the world, coming along, reading it, as I kind of did. Uh, you kind of take their concepts, mm. you're extracting it, and then you're building careers out of it. So some people, you know, the feminist collectives that are refusing to have their work translated, they will not have their work translated into English because that's what happens. As soon as their ideas, they get extracted and... and and taken away from them, and, yeah. they, and other people get to benefit, and, and they're done. Other people are refusing to publish at all. They're just saying, no, we're not going to do that. We're going to communicate in different ways that can't have that no. uh, extractivist yeah. relation. That's my problem with Creative Commons licenses, because I, d I think that they work uh, against uh, authors of less privileged uh, context, because everybody can take your work, and then that other person will take your work and publish it under a copyright, you know with a good American publisher, and then you're basically, I'm sorry for the word, fucked, yes, in this sense. And, uh, and of course I agree that, that uh, this is not a homogenous space. So we have to think of, 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 of ways of ensuring that this is not happening. And, uh, uh, and of course I'm all for, as you said, um, um, uh, anti-copyright piracy, yes. And these kind of things, I think it's super important, that kind of freedom to, uh, to use ideas and to circulate them. At the same time, of course, this free circulation very often works against uh, people who are not in privileged geographical yeah, and geopolitical situations. And that is something that, yes, we have to think about and it's, uh, I don't have a good answer to that, of course. But I still think that there is, you know, um, apart from working on this on this project, I, I also uh, co-founded a digital journal uh, 10 years ago, um, so much later than, uh, than Gary. And uh, I remember our first, I mean, the journal appeared uh, in a very spontaneous way. We got a grant and we wrote in that grant proposal, like stupidly, we're going to publish the results of our research online. And when we got the grant, we said, like, what does it mean, actually? What are we going to do, you know? And then we thought, okay, so let's, let's do a journal. I mean, that would be the most interesting thing. And then we talked to our friends and they said, no, we want to make a journal. And then it turned out that there's like around eight or nine people who wanted to do the same thing, so we started the journal. And then I said, listen, but it doesn't make any sense to print because we're going to kill ourselves for the money we need to, to, to have a, an issue printed. And it's going to be tedious and difficult and then nobody will read it because we're going to publish it in 500 copies and then we'll have to put it into suitcases and fly to conferences to give it to people, you know, stuff like that. Let's push it out there. Let's, let's make it an open access digital journal and um, it's going to work. And then apparently I heard that in the ministry we are, we are being shown around as a, as a perfect example of an open access journal, which is published for free. And that is something that's, that's also terrible, yes? Because then the grant givers say, well, if you, publish, uh, if you publish online and open access, it's for free. And that is also this kind of problem, yes? That nobody sees the amount of work uh, that, 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 that goes into that. Because it's, if it's printed, it's serious. You know? <laughs> that is the real work, you know? But if you do it uh, in a digital way, then it's basically, it's virtual. It doesn't, it doesn't cost anything, yes? So that is also a problem that... Um, uh, that I think you have experienced uh, too, no? Uh, in, in, in publishing digital uh, things. Yeah. Should we let people ask? Yes, please, comments? have questions mm -hmm. if you have any. 
Roman. Okay, thank you very for your presentations very much. Uh, Gary and you, Krzysztof, you talked a lot about uh, openness and open access. I wanted to ask you about uh, what about the relation between the reader and the publisher. I mean, I, as a reader, have some publishers which I trust and I know they select, they pick works for me that I like and enjoy. I'm not sure if I want a world where everybody can publish everything because I don't know if I could pick the right things to read. You, know? you already live in such a world. Yeah, okay, sure. <laughs> So that's my question. What about the relation? Where is the publisher, or is there any publisher in this um, in this in this model with the free access? Well, Open Humanities Press is a publisher. It's a, it's collective. It's a collective. Yeah. So, yeah, I mean, we 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 kind of have a we kind of have a vision and a model. And if you like, you're not going to like everything and things. And again, we're quite multifaceted and plural and things like that, so you're not going to like everything. Um, I understand what you mean. I guess I'm interested in maybe there being a moment where that breaks down and we move to something else. Because partly what you're saying is you going to abdicate some of your responsibility to make some decisions. You want someone else to gatekeep and make these decisions for you. And I would kind of say, well, it's more important that people make different decisions or have a space to make some different decisions. Now, it's never going to be completely all open and free and you, you, you're never going to be able to have somebody nudging you in one direction or another for example, precisely the reasons we've talked about. There's going to be some texts that are easier to access than others. I mean, a lot of the, you know, uh, the reason, the reason Facebook's so dominant, the reason, you know, all these platforms are so dominant is partly because they spend a lot of money on their interface. So they're really, really easy to, to access, to use. Um, you know, if you want to use pirate sites, they're getting a bit better, but you, know, you, used to, you, know, you used to have a little certain amount of technical competency. You used to have to put up with spam, porn, all sorts of things flooding. Um, and so there's still going to be things like that. They're going to nudge you one direction or other. What I would like is we move from the current system to something else. Uh, and I suppose that's what we're on the journey of, of moving us to something else. So to get there, we might have to have some moments where you are going to feel a little bit lost and confused. And, but maybe that's, that's, maybe that's an OK thing. I don't mind um, readers feeling confused and lost or angry or that's you know that's okay i mean there's a whole load of questions we can talk about that because mm -hmm. some of the conversations we've had of like oh and i built this website and then the the reader didn't click on this or they clicked on this and i didn't like it and they didn't go where i wanted them to go and it's like is that what we're doing and i don't know i don't know um i was the last conference i went to went to was uh, just a a few weeks ago was the Electronic Literature Organization conference, and they were talking about second and third generation of electronic literature. So the second generation was, you know, all hypertext. It was all kind of modernist, uh, difficult to read, difficult to access. The reader had to go and find, uh, go and find those texts. It, it, it was not user friendly, but they were finding well, fewer and fewer people were actually reading this stuff. They were kind of writing themselves out of an audience, if you like. So the third generation all really moved to where people were. So they started using social media platforms. They started using the Instagram. They started using all these different platforms to try and do something creative and interesting on those platforms. And I'm kind of wondering, I'm much more instinctually in that second, I want to do something that's difficult, that's annoying, that's fragmented, that's alienating, and, but I'm kind of thinking, what about that? Is, that? is that always the right way to go? Maybe I can't bring myself to kind of think, oh, I'm going to create with Twitter. But do we need to do an end? So, you know, the panel before lunch was, you know, we're going to build all these platforms or these websites and we're going to need some money and we're going to need some funding for it. Uh, and but there was a little bit about control about there. We're going to, we're going to kind of still maintain some control because we're going to have the audience and they're going to interact but they're still the audience 
we haven't quite moved over to, well, the audience can actually be co-authors, they can be co-creators. We kind of were still hanging back from that. And I'm wondering about that. I'm wondering whether, and so your reader would not, for me, remain in the reader. The reader would be moving over to something else. And it's too easy to say they would be co-author, but they would be, there would be something else. They might be co-editor, co co-curator was a trend a couple of years ago. They'd be kind of moving something like that. So those kind of categories might be breaking down in the process of becoming something else. Um, before I, um, um, may I just comment uh, quickly? Um, because I, ha I, have, I have two things, uh, one to Roman and, and one to Gary. Uh, to Roman, um, uh, you know, I mean, the gatekeepers have all, I mean, we live in a very uh, um, spread out and networked situation. And that is also interesting because we have much more gatekeepers right now, yes? Uh, or I don't know, filters, yes? Because we don't have only the, the serious literary critics, but we have also bloggers and influencers and people who Instagram about books they have read and friends on Facebook who, who tell you what they have read and why this book is interesting. And it may be from an obscure publisher. And, you know, and this friend texts you and said, Romek, I just read this fantastic book. You know, look at it. So uh, it's not like you are bound to the, to, to the publishers you love, but uh, you have also like hundreds of sources around you that can that can provide you with this kind of input yes and for example i have a huge problem with publishers because like like uh, uh, okay i love books that are published by mac like like nearly I, basically every every photo book they have published is fantastic so you know so there are publishers like that of course and everybody probably everybody has these kind of publishing houses that they love yes but for example you know, um, academic publishing houses, and I'm not talking about the huge players, yes, but for, in Poland, for example, that's a huge problem in the sense that they don't publish anything anymore if you, if you don't bring the money. So basically, it's like there's no filter anymore. They will publish anything provided that you have a grant and, you have, and that you have money to publish your book. So uh, review processes are, are I'm, I'm not saying that they're totally fictitious, but it's not like it used to be, yes? So it's, uh, there, there aren't really serious filters anymore. So I think that it's more about specific people who you trust wherever they publish, rather than these institutions which have become obsolete. I mean, they're dinosaurs and their, their, their business models are antiquated. And so this is also a problem, for example, if you want to translate something and you, you write to a big publisher and they don't answer you for two months. And then they tell you that, you know, uh, uh, like a French publisher did, you, uh, we wanted to, to publish a short fragment of a memoir. And they told us like 1,800 euros for 15 pages of translation. I was like, are you crazy? We are an open access journal. Well, if you're open access, then it's even more expensive, you know. Um, uh, so these are all these kind of um, very um, um, perverse dynamics of capitalism in the context of publishing in the digital in the digital sphere. So the positive thing about the moment is it doesn't the gatekeepers don't have to be based on money like yeah. you say in the Polish system is, but neither does it have to be someone patrician like Susan Sontag. God, have you read her? I, what a biography? God, she's a nightmare. Tell you me, and I would not want Susan Sontag kind of making any decisions yeah. about what any of us can publish or not publish. Uh, but we can have different values. And the thing about this moment is we can work out what that is. We have a little bit of freedom. Freedom's not quite the right word, but a space where we can actually move to something different. We've got to try and take that. I guess that's what we're all here for. Yeah. It's what we're working towards. It's you know, what is that going to look like? And it's not for me to come and tell everyone this, like, I've got the answer. It's for us to kind of work out in events like this, in situations like this. Yeah. Eva, I uh, had a question. Yeah, but I don't know. Hi, uh, I have a question to Gary. Uh, from your um, years, decades of uh, experience, <laughs> I wanted to ask about this idea of the collaborative authorship, especially in the context of academic writing. Do you know any um, examples of really outstanding work that would emerge from that type of uh, collaboration? Because I love, uh, I love the idea in theory, but um, I'm not sure if I know any really good examples if that really worked in, um, in practice. Um, 
you mentioned uh, new materialism um, at the beginning of your uh, of your presentation, and I uh, I remember that one very specific um, strand of philosophy, um, speculative realism, was actually being did being was born digitally on the on the blogs uh, uh, between various uh, uh, philosophers but then uh, after all they all published under their own uh, names <laughs> their their individual books uh, monographies so um, so my question uh, is is about uh, some good examples uh, maybe from uh, from uh, from your publisher uh, of those uh, collaborative um, uh, projects. Uh, got that. Uh, okay, so that would be my problem with a lot of those new materialists. You know, I'm going back to Timothy Morton and Bruno Latour and Meso and, and Graham Harmon and things like that. It's all really, really interesting and we publish series with them. We've got series with Graham Harmon and, and Bruno Latour. And, and yes, but my problem is they talk a good game uh, and they talk we talked about post-humanism and they're kind of moving they moving towards that end of the, the, the spectrum. But the way that they actually perform, or the way that they actually are, the way that they work, is kind of liberal humanists. I mean, you know, th that's what they do. They kind of, and even the blog, I mean, blogs are kind of still quite very, uh, can be very individualistic. Um, and But yes, you're right, as soon as they kind of move over, they publish books in their own name, they've got the copyright on them, they're kind of still quite linear, they're very traditional, so they're still in that mode, and most academia is, and that's why we're trying to push it, and it's, that's, quite, uh, that's quite hard. Um, okay, the, I can do a really smart answer, uh, which is uh, all books are written collaboratively. We just deny that or replace it. Or black box it because you know uh, nothing that I write is just by me it's with coming to the situations like this and hearing your questions and other people saying things and I might go back and change something but it's all the people that you know that taught me the students I engage with my colleagues that I engage with uh, people librarians that direct me in certain directions and take me out of other directions it's all the the material elements that kind of are included in publications. So it'd be the trees and the ink and the shipping and the environmental damage of all that. They're already all part of that. I guess what I'm interested in is how we move towards acknowledging that rather than what I was talking about is black boxing it or repressing it or keeping it out. How do we do that? And that's pretty much what we're trying to do. We're trying to move, and you can't do it all of the time with everything, but just moving more and more towards trying to um, include that and acknowledging that. And so um, we have colleagues from a press called Mattering Press, uh, and they try and do that much more. They work collaboratively. They try and acknowledge, they come from science and technology studies. So they're very influenced by that kind of materialism, that, uh, and they're trying to much more uh, acknowledge the work of other people that will be involved in the production of the books. Um, and, you know, you've been very careful and very generous, and I was feeling a bit embarrassed about it, and acknowledging all the people that have been working on these kind of projects. Um, and I tried to do it a little bit, but, you know, I felt it would take up too much time, and yeah. <laughs> uh, so I did exclude them very a bit violently. But, uh, but we might also want to, ex you know, include some environmental factors, some other kind of material facts. How do we do that? And what does that do for our notions of what a book is and what authorship is and what copyright is? That's the kind of thing we're, we're moving towards. But there are people doing it. I mean, you know, Joanna's going to show a film tomorrow, which is kind of engaging with AI and that kind of moving authorship creativity with, uh, with technology. Uh, friend and someone else we kind of have published, but this book is not ours. And Mark America has just written a book with the AI technology and kind of co-written with it. So you can do it, and people are doing it. Yeah, they can't, in some ways, the, the form of the book is still quite traditional, but it's kind of playing around with authorship and trying to experiment with that. Felix, do you still have a question? I want to take up a bit of Gary's notion of situated openness. 
I mean, this, this notion of openness, of we have to make it accessible to the entire world and, and everybody you know, can collaborate and all of that, is a very kind of founding I don't know, utopia of, of, of the internet. And it clearly hasn't worked out particularly well. <laughs> and um, there are lots of you know, extractive models that build on this openness and yeah, we don't need to be you know, for people to produce culture doesn't matter, you know, it should just circulate and we just extract the data and then, you know, build all of that. This is kind of the one, one problem where I'm very, you know, interested in this, in this moment of, you know, how do we, when do we, you know, close things again. And the other, the other one is, is openness. Yes, it, it produces a great archive, the, but it also produces a kind of monoculture. Yeah, people are doing interesting things on Instagram, but you know, by and large, it's still Instagram and Facebook and Twitter and all of that. Mm -hmm. And before, we used to have um, you know an underground uh, kind of that had different distribution processes, different, uh, and this looked different. It was difficult to find. You had to go to a city to find it and all of that. But it provided a space that was, you know, when you were on the outside, often felt pretty hermetic. This wasn't. I mean, at least the, un the underground parts that I knew of, they weren't friendly, they weren't welcoming, but they managed to produce a kind of a very different um, uh, view and, and being in the world. And I wonder, you know, where the, you know, how to combine these two things, right? Because we don't want to go back to, to kind of secret knowledge and, you know, only if you're part of the club, you will be, you know, allowed to, to hear that special, you know, enchanting phrase but this putting it out and letting the, the robots you know, extract everything is also kind of um, you know, problematic. So where do you sure. see us operating in this tension? Mm -hmm. uh, I'm feeling very nervous about sitting on a stage in Woods and criticizing the avant-garde. It feels, I haven't gone around that museum <laughs> yesterday. Uh, <laughs> feels like it's the home of the avant-garde. Um, I, I, no, I, know, I agree with what you're saying. Um, I know where you're coming from. I mean, my, one of my, pro I mean, openness hasn't worked out well. I would say situatedness might not have worked out very well because I agree with it and I completely know where it's coming from. But certainly in an American context, it kind of slipped into identity politics. We've all, we've all got a name, what our identity is and where we're coming from and, and you know, check our privilege and all of that. And it slips back in a very, what I would think is a very conservative notion of, of identity. So all these things, none of these things are pure. None of these things, you know, uh, are unproblematic. I mean, that's the politics, isn't it? The politics of kind of fighting and struggling for it. And they're all realizing, well, you just don't care about that concept anymore. And it's being so co-opted or taken away that you just think, I'm ready to give it up and, and move on. Um, when you were talking about the avant-garde, it made me think, and again, I'm kind of, I'm still wrestling with this notion of this second and third generation of electronic literature. It made me think, and I, I, I find it, I'm really trying to resist it, but still, it makes me think something like TikTok. So yeah, you know, me and you are gonna go, oh, TikTok, and I'm definitely not doing the dance, and I'm not kind of, you know, doing all that music and all that kind of stuff, because uh, we want what we're thinking of as the avant-garde. We want something more like that. But maybe rather than producing something new, that constant repetition and these kind of minor differences, maybe there's something in that. Now, I don't know, and I'm definitely... Oh, God, I hope I'm not going to be back here in two years' time and I'm kind of king of TikTok or something. But I'm definitely not going on... I'm definitely not going on TikTok. Uh, God, that would be so... Sad. If I could think of... You know, they do book talk, but that's kind of... You know, it's for, for young women and whatever, but if I could think of an interesting way of doing it that would be slightly mischievous, maybe I can do it. But, you know, I'm not going to do that because that's not where we're at and we're probably not the right person to do it. But I'm just wondering, rather than just saying, I'm really sorry, Woods, rather than thinking, looking back to the avant-garde that we you know, really value and things, maybe there's something else. Maybe to be really challenging for us, it has to be something like TikTok. It has to be something that we're just not going to understand and it's going to be yeah, so threatening and or we're going to just, you know, we're turning into our 
parents or our parents' parents, isn't it? What's this really stupid thing that you're doing now? And for me, it was all sorts of kinds of music and subcultures and people that did. It's book talk. And, yeah, what is it about photos of open books with cups of coffee and things like that? I mean, it's just, you know, it's bizarre, but anyway, for me. Thank you. Maybe this is a good um, finishing line for our panel, uh, because we have already gone over time. Thank you so much, Gary. Um, it, it was great to talk to you. And um, <clears throat> let's have a 10-minute break and meet, yes, 35, 12 minutes for the last panel today. And afterwards, uh, I would like to invite you to the screening of uh, film essays uh, prepared by the Film Essay Studio. Uh, but also uh, the curatorial walk uh, that will be, um, uh, yes, that's starting at the info point at six with Agnieszka Sural, the curator of the exhibition. Thank you. <laughs>